We're going to read from the Bible in 2 Timothy chapter 3. It's page 996, if you're following along in the Bibles that are around you. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we begin at the first verse. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And the verses to which I would like to draw your attention are verses 6 to 9. It begins, For among them, that is, among these folks with a power that is uh, absent in relationship to their testimony of godliness. Among them are those who act in this particular way. Um, a couple of our friends this week are apparently attending a masquerade ball. I don't know if you've ever been to one. I, I never have. I, I'm not sure that I really like the idea, I suppose. Um, I, I guess it can be playful and harmless, but there's something just about the very name that seems bothersome to me. And, and a little bit unsettling. It's probably just my problem. But it partly has to do with just the word itself. And masquerade as an adjective, of course, is used in front of party or ball or celebration. But as a noun, uh, a masquerade is a pretended outward appearance. It is a false outward show. And when you use the word as a verb, to masquerade, it means to go about in disguise to assume a false appearance. And I guess that's the thing that I just kind of don't like about it. If I go to a party, I want to be able to see people. I want to see their eyes, and I think it's important that they see mine as well. But uh, to spend the evening realizing that underneath the mask, you will be able to find hidden the real person is just a little disturbing to me. And I begin there because that is exactly what Paul is dealing with here in the context of the family of God in Ephesus. Uh, Timothy has been warned about these individuals who are among them there in Ephesus who have been concealing their true selves underneath a masquerade, underneath the mask of uh, presumed godliness. In other words, they've been presenting themselves in a certain way in order to achieve a certain objective, but that there is a falsity about them at their very core. We're going to see that they won't get very far, 
but nevertheless, they do a devastating work. So they're, they're religious activity because these individuals uh, are religious. They have a form of godliness. It's a thin disguise for them. Uh, there ain't no way, to quote Don Henley, that they can hide their, their lying eyes. I know it's used a little differently, but nevertheless, that's the facts. They, they're not going to be able to do this. Now, I think it's very important that we remind ourselves, and you may do this by turning back with me for a moment to Acts chapter 20, because in Acts chapter 20, Luke records for us, as we know, the departure of Paul uh, from Ephesus. And as he leaves Ephesus, Acts chapter 20, he's able to say to them, you know, I've been very, very faithful in uh, telling you the story of Jesus and what the gospel is all about and so on. And, uh, and now he says, I, I want you to make sure, verse 28, that you pay careful attention, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God. This is the responsibility of eldership and leadership in the church, to care for God's people. And it is a very precious thought because these people have been obtained at the cost of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, and the reason this is so important, verse 29, is because I know that after my departure, fierce, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. So they're just going to emerge among you, and they'll begin to deviate a little bit. They'll begin to twist things just a little bit. In the home Bible study groups, they'll be saying, well, I'm not sure that's what it really means. I don't think that that is this and so on. So he says, if you're going to be overseeing the flock of God here, it is imperative that you pay careful attention, first of all, to yourselves, and then, of course, to those who are under your care. Well, here's a question. We turn back to 2 Timothy 3. Do you think these folks listened to what Paul said? And if they did pay careful attention and tend the flock, how do we account throughout 1 and 2 Timothy for Paul's frequent references to the presence and the harmful influence of false teachers in the Ephesian context? Well, ultimately, the answer is that the devil sows tares amongst the wheat, and that in the presence of righteousness and truth, you will find unrighteousness and error. And that is why, in the same way as parents have to ex juris exercise jurisdiction over their children to prevent them from succumbing to tempting influences that may appeal to them, so the leaders in the church of God have to exercise the same kind of care over the spiritual children entrusted to them. And the staggering thought and an important thought is simply this that if it could happen in Ephesus, and it did, then it can happen in Cleveland. If you've been reading through Murray McShane, you will know that in the course of the readings in the Psalms at the moment, you will have come as I have come. And I used to read verses like this without giving it much thought at all. But now I read them very differently. It's a product of age. O oh God, from my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, O God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation and your power to all those who come. See what he's saying? He's saying, make sure that I stay the course and that those entrusted to my care are the beneficiaries of all that I've known of your grace and your favor and your faithfulness. That's what Paul is doing. As he says to Timothy, at the time for my departure has come, I'm going away, you're staying. Make sure, Timothy, make sure. And in order that he is not na naive about things, he identifies these characters. Let me say again to you that the real threat to the church in Ephesus and throughout all of history, right up until today, is not external political pressure from outside. It's not economic issues. 
No, the real threat to the church is and always has been and always will be the internal threat of dissolution, of moral and doctrinal declension on the part of leadership, which then filters through into the very core of churches. You're sensible people. You can figure it out. Towards the end of his life, and I'll give you just one illustration of it from church history, General Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, who died, I think, in 1912, was asked on the threshold of the 20th, 20th century, what do you see, General Booth, as the peculiar challenges that will face the church in the 20th century? And he replied as follows. The chief dangers, he said, will be religion without the Holy Spirit, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell. Pretty remarkable, isn't it? And the story of the 20th century is largely a fulfillment, not entirely, but is largely a fulfillment of the dangers that Booth saw across the horizon. In other words, the, the presence in the existing church of Jesus Christ of those a la 2 Timothy 3, 5, who have an appearance of godliness but deny its power. Now, Paul is making sure that Timothy and his congregation don't fiddle around with this stuff. It doesn't seem very politically correct. The concluding sentence of verse 5, just three words in English, avoid such people, probably hits most of us a little strangely, creates a little uncomfortableness in us, or discomfort in us, one should say, because we've been taught, now you're not supposed to avoid anybody. But Paul says, no, you should avoid certain people. And I, what I find fascinating is the fact that Paul is quite prepared to name names. He doesn't name all the names, but he gives us illustrations. In fact, he does so in every chapter, if you check. In chapter 1, dealing with a problem, he says, for example, I'm talking about people like Phygelus and Hermogenes. In chapter 2, he says, Hymenaeus and Philetus. In chapter 4, he says, Demas and Alexander the metal worker who did me great harm. And here in chapter 3, he pulls two figures from the history of the people of God, Janus and Jambres, who were around as con men in the time of Moses the prophet. He says, I want you to make sure that you avoid these people on account of their contaminating influence. Now, he goes on to point out that these characters have a target audience, and their target audience are, is, uh, according to our text here in the ESV, uh, weak women. Weak women. If you're using the NIV, uh, it is weak-willed women. If you're using the King James Version, it is silly women. The adjective is very important. This is not a blanket statement that Paul is making regarding the nature and character of women. That would be absurd. After all, you only need your Bible to make sure that you don't fall foul of that notion, a notion that is perpetrated often. When you hear people speak, they say the Apostle Paul was very unkind to women, he didn't like women, and so on. These people have never paid attention to what the Bible says. He's already given instruction to Timothy as the pastor to make sure that he is exemplary when it comes to the issue of how he cares for the women in his church, because they are to be cared for. This is what he says, 1 Timothy 5, "'Treat the older women as mothers, and the girls as your sisters, thinking only pure thoughts about them.'" Why? Because it is imperative that if you're going to exercise pastoral oversight over them, you have to make sure that you don't fall foul of the temptations that are part and parcel of the privileged influence that you have inevitably in people's lives. That's the danger of school teachers over children, same sex or opposite sex, people in influence and authority. And so Paul is very, very concerned. I mentioned this, of course, in the first service. In the second service, I, I met a number of mothers as I was walking around, and I met a number of sisters, I suppose, although as I, as I passed a, a group of uh, uh, young ladies, I said to myself, well, these are my sisters. And then as I went into my cave and closed the door, I said, no, actually, these are my daughters. <laughs> that's, that's how old I am. So, so I got a new category as well. You see, the older women as mothers, uh, the, 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 the sort of mid-core as sisters, and then once you go down a notch, then they become your daughters. But the point is, in, in, in a concern for the welfare of their own spiritual growth, 
because these fellows were at the game. These charlatans had a completely different agenda. So I'll leave it to you to follow this up. But you read the letters of Paul, and you will discover the number of women that were involved in ministry with him and the affection that he had for them and the respect that entails to them, even, for example, if you only read Romans chapter 16. Now, the false teachers are targeting this particular kind of woman, a weak-willed woman, a silly woman. In other words, they're going down the street, uh, uh, corrupting Roy Orbison's lyrics, uh, singing to themselves, silly woman walking down the street, silly woman, kind I like to meet. That's their whole objective. The dafter, the better. The crazier, the better. The more gullible, the better. The more distressed and disturbed, the better. It's a target audience. Paul says, Timothy, you need to understand this. What are these women like? Well, you'll see in the text. They are burdened with sins, and they are led astray by various passions. Now, he doesn't articulate what this is, but that's enough for us to know, isn't it? They were burdened, and they, be they were bewildered, and yes, they were bewitched as well. Bewitched, burdened, and bewildered. These are the ones that they'll be going for, he says. Now, what is this? Well, it's a sad picture, isn't it? It's a sad picture of women who are curious, needy, gullible, susceptible, and particularly susceptible to the approaches of these charlatans who were probably attractive and charismatic characters. I mean, silly they may be and uh, involved in various passions and burdened by guilt, but there's no reason to think that they would find ogres and obviously malevolent characters as a source of comfort and inspiration for them. Now, the ones we've got to watch are the ones we don't think we need to watch. In my notes, I found a comment that I can't source, but it was a good comment, so I put them back in, they, describing these, these individuals. They are women oppressed by feelings of guilt and eager to try any quack remedy which does not require them to abandon their sins. They don't want to give up on their passions, but somehow or another they want to get their guilt fixed. If I could be relieved of my guilt, but still at the same time, continue doing what I'm doing. Well, of course, you're never going to get that answer in the gospel, but you may get the answer in a pseudo-gospel. And notice what he says. The burdened in this way and led by various passions, they are, verse 7, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Their curiosity, fed by these nebulous notions, eventually renders them incapable of arriving at a knowledge of the truth. And that phrase there, a knowledge of the truth, is used again in the pastorals, and it simply is a statement concerning the gospel itself, that this knowledge of the truth is the truth of all that God has done for us in Jesus, that he has provided an atoning sacrifice for our sins, that he has been raised for our justification, that he intercedes for us, and so on, and that in him there is forgiveness, and there is cleansing, and there is hope, and there is transformation. But somehow or another, that never registers. Somehow or another, they get the cross, but they also get the crystals. So you see them driving in the car, and they have a cross hanging from the rearview mirror, and they have crystals hanging alongside the cross. I hope you don't. Well, what are they doing? Presumably hedging their bets. Well, maybe there's something in that old age of that Jesus of Nazareth. Maybe there's something in the new age, and so on. I, I don't really know. Remember, I told you in the early part of the summer, I came through Chagrin Falls and found a number of these ladies banging on drums in the town hall in Chagrin. There were one or two men, but the vast majority were women. It's not very nice of me to say I don't know their hearts. But I guess they were curious, probably gullible, and definitely an easy target for religious hucksters. You'll notice that these individuals operate very carefully. They are those 
who creep. They creep into households. Why? Because they're creeps. <laughs> it's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Creeps creep. Whether they creep in through the waves of the Internet, or the television, or the driveway. In the NIV, it says that they worm their way into the homes of weak old women. They come, they come worming their way in. They're deceptive. They're infiltrators. They have enough of the truth to con people. But when you push to the very core of it, they deny the things that lie at the heart of the gospel. Essentially, what Timothy is saying here to Timothy as a pastor in Ephesus is, you need to be alert to the presence of these weak women, because you have a responsibility to the women in your congregation. And you need also to be aware of the strategy of these bad men. So, weak women and bad men. They employ the tactics of religious propaganda. Actually, they, they, there's nothing new about this tactical approach. If you read the Bible from the very beginning, you find that this is, this is the devil's tactic, isn't it? Straight into the Garden of, uh, Garden of Eden and straight for Eve. If I can get her, I'll probably get Adam as well. Think of all the discord that then ensues within the initial family the jealousy and the bitterness and the murderous hatred that just engulfs them, susceptible to lies. Did God really say that? A little bit of the truth, because he said that, but not all of that. And so, confusion and infiltration and deception. And so here we are all these years later in Ephesus, and these heretical teachers are still using the same methodology. Their approach is insidious. It is beguiling. And their approach, he says, is actually not dissimilar, verse 8, to Janus and Jambres, who opposed Moses. Well, you say, well, who in the world were they? I never read about them in the Bible. No, they're not in the Bible except for here. Well, aren't they back with Moses? No, they're never identified as Janus and Jambres when you read Exodus 7. But when you read Exodus 7, you will discover that there were magicians who duplicated what Aaron was doing. Aaron had a rod, and he exercised the authority of God by the directive of Moses the prophet. And the, the con men came along and said, we can, we can do that too. You have this, we have one of these as well. You can do that, we can do that. And as Jewish tradition emerged, the names of these characters were attached to the incidents back in Exodus. And that's why Paul, having been brought un up under Gamaliel within the context of Jewish instruction, would have been familiar with who the characters were, these, these magicians who opposed the work of God, these charlatans who were around. They're always around. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is the Word of God. You don't have to go going around saying, oh, I think maybe, perhaps. No, it just actually says it in the Bible. Moses was a great prophet. And he was opposed by these characters. And Paul is the apostle, and he's opposed. And Timothy, you're going to be the pastor, and you're going to be opposed as well. Now, what makes it so difficult, of course, is the way in which the characters involved use terminology that is biblical, but they distort its meaning. They use biblical terminology, but they distort its meaning. I've told you this many times before, and you'll come up against this. I have been in churches where the fellow has been affirming for me the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, it, and if I wasn't listening carefully, I wouldn't have realized that what he was talking about was something very, very different from what the New Testament says about the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus says that he was died, he was buried, and on the third day he rose again. Bodily, physically, identifiably was risen from the dead. And the reality of his physical risen presence transformed the disciples. This character who's in the pulpit telling everybody about the resurrection actually believed that the resurrection was a spiritual resurrection, that he didn't actually physically rise from the dead, but he rose spiritually, and he invaded the minds of his disciples, and they had a spiritual kind of resurrection, a sort of New Age resurrection all of their own. 
and the people who are sitting listening. They don't realize that their pastor does not believe in the risen, physical resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. But he uses the terminology. That's why we have to read our Bibles. That's why I always tell you, you better read the Bible to find out if what myself and my colleagues are telling you is in this book. This is serious. Not just for our own generation, but for the generations who follow us. My own nation was known historically as the, as the nation of the book. What book? The Bible. Where's the Bible now? largely missing from the vast majority of pulpits. How did that happen? Because men did not pay careful attention. Now, notice that Paul is quite prepared to call it like it is. These men, he says, oppose the truth. They oppose the truth. You don't, need, you don't really need much to—I uh, mean, that doesn't need any exposition, does it? truth, oppose the truth. When you have time this afternoon, you might want to read Acts chapter 13, an amazing story in there about Paul and Barnabas proclaiming the gospel, the Word of God, uh, in, the, in the synagogues. And uh, they're in Paphos on Cyprus. And uh, Luke tells us that there came a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the Word of God. So here you have this political figure, an intelligent man. He realizes that Paul and Barnabas have something to say. He wants to hear from them, so he summons them. They come to speak, and along comes Elymas the magician. And Elymas the magician opposed them. Why? seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. That's what he was doing. He didn't want, he didn't want the Sergius Paulus uh, to, to, to trust this Jesus that Paul and Barnabas were proclaiming. And so Paul said, well, it doesn't really matter. There's all kinds of different ways you can go at this. And Bar-Jesus, you're a nice man. And, you know, I've, I've always liked your name, and, and, uh, and I've heard about you, and you've done some amazing tricks at some of the parties that have been around. I mean, you really are terrific. And we can all get on well together. We'll be fine. It's not a problem. I mean, we, we're explaining it one way, and you're explaining it another way. After all, we all have our own truth, don't we? Now, you're looking at me, but you're not looking in your Bible to see whether this is in the Bible. You've already decided that can't possibly be what he said. No, but you're not ready for what he did say. Let me tell you what he said. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? He put his finger on exactly what he was doing. You're just making crooked what is absolutely straight. You remember he said to Paul, to Timothy, Timothy, I want you to make sure that you cut it straight. The word that is used is for cutting a garment so that it lines up so that the shoulder sets in or whatever it might be. Make sure you cut it absolutely straight. You can't be going weaving all over the place. These characters were weaving all over the place. Paul had faced it in Paphos. He identified it as a potential in Ephesus. And now he warns Timothy. They oppose the truth. They are corrupted in mind, and they are disqualified regarding the faith. You see, this is part of the challenge of our time, isn't it? Is people say, well, who's to say you're right? Who's to say you're wrong? And you see, as soon as you, as soon as you dispense with the Bible, you, you have nothing to you, you have no basis upon which to adjudicate on anything. Why do we believe what we believe about the nature of marriage? Because of what God's Word says. Why do we believe what we believe about the person and work of Jesus? Because of what God's Word says. Why, then, would we identify something as being opposed to the truth? Which truth is this truth? that these men's minds would be depraved, diverted, 
corrupted. Who says, me? No, not me. My mind may one day become depraved and corrupted and disqualified. It doesn't say they are as, as far as faith is concerned, they're disqualified. No, there's a definite article. As far as the faith is concerned, they are disqualified. What is the faith? The faith once delivered to the saints, for which Jude says, I was going to write to you a bunch of different stuff, but I determined that I would have to write to you to contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. Why? Because if you don't contend for the faith as a body of absolutely understandable doctrine, then there will be those among you who say, you don't need to pay attention to that. You don't need to be as defined as that. You don't need to be as clear as that. There are a number of ways you can go at this. There are various views on the gospel. After all, you're a hard nut, and so on. And the real question is, right here, it's no surprise that Timothy is going to, get, going to get verse 16 at the end of chapter 3. All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for reproof and for training of righteousness. But that's what Paul is leading to. But here, let's finish on a positive note, because Paul finishes on a positive note. He says, you've got the weak women, you've got the bad men, but you've got a sovereign Lord. You have a sovereign Lord. He says, they may have another day in the sun. You can look at verse 13. But eventually, their folly will become apparent to everyone. Eventually, the day will come when it will be apparent that the house that they tried to build, they were trying to build with cardboard, and the city of God will remain. The charlatans will eventually be exposed. And church history reveals that to be the case, doesn't it? You can go in a secondhand bookstore, especially a theological bookstore, and find all these little books about, about heresies from the past. You can buy them for like 25 cents because they're, they're, they're finished. Oh, they may be arriving in another disguise, but, but it's over. And you know, think about uh, living, living here this last while. We've had, we've had Sung Young Moon at the Moonies. Do you remember? We've had the Branch Davidian. We've had Jim Jones and the Lemonade. We've had Harry Krishna. Not to mention the cultic activities which continue in our own valley right around us the quasi-gospels, the pseudo-gospels of Jehovah's Witnesses, of Unitarianism, of Christian science, of Mormonism, and of an external moribund religiosity represented in so many different places. But Timothy, just remember this. God is not remotely upset or concerned or threatened by counterfeits. God, if we can picture God, if I might say so reverently, the idea that God somehow is looking down and going, oh, I can't believe this is happening. Wow. No, from our perspective, from the perspective of first century Ephesus, Christianity was trembling on the brink of annihilation. Was it going to make it from the apostolic church to the post-apostolic church? Would Timothy hold the line? Would he entrust it to faithful men? Would the next generation grow up to love and follow God? That was the question. From a human perspective, you couldn't say. From God's perspective, it was never in doubt. The same is true of us today. That's why Paul is concerned that Timothy will just keep his head, that he will endure hardship, that he will do the work of an evangelist, that he will discharge all the duties of his ministry, because Jesus has said, I will build my church. I will build my church, says Jesus, and the gates of hell will not actually be able to prevail against it. And that, you see, helps us at the end of the day to say, how do we handle the strategy of these bad men? How do we care for these weak-willed women? And the answer is, in the sovereign proviso of God Himself. If we had time, I could get, take you to John 4, which I don't. You'll be relieved to know. And we could engage in the encounter between Jesus and a weak-willed woman, who was apparently always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. She was swayed by all kinds of passions. She'd had five husbands, and she had a live-in lover. If ever there was somebody in need of living water, it was the lady at the well. And what happened to her? She found it. Found it where? In a philosophy? No, in a person. Just in any person? No, in one person, the only one. 
the only one who can deal with our swayed hearts and with our burdened lives. So whether you are a silly man or a silly woman, I commend you to the wisdom that is found in Jesus. Father, thank you that when we bow beneath the authority of your Word, things actually begin to make sense. Every day we're buffeted by all kinds of notions and ideas, and we're so thankful that your Word shines like a light on our pathway. Come to us, Lord, I pray. Come to some of us who may be burdened by sins and, and led astray by passions, and we've been looking for all kinds of answers, but we somehow or another have never bowed our knee to Jesus. Grant that today we may do so. And, and remind those of us who are tempted to get completely discombobulated by all this stuff that Jesus Christ is a sovereign and a reigning Lord and King, that nothing is actually out of control, nor will it get out of control. Hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen.